Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. I'll first ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, and then um, we, we, we've got some kind of loaded questions that we want to go over. So, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Cherry. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Brown University in Providence. And where were you before Brown? Citizens Financial Group, Royal Bank of Scotland. So, and before that, the Postal Service. I went from government to financial services to the wild, wild west. <laughs> Matt? Uh, Matt Moynihan, I'm CEO of a company called Vericode. Uh, we're a cloud-based uh, application security testing company. And uh, prior to that, I was with a uh, Symantec managing a consumer and small business division. And, and what does Vericode do? Okay. Uh, we essentially do automated code reviews in the cloud. So you upload uh, your binary to us, you know, millions and millions of lines of code, and we turn it around like a FedEx package overnight and tell you everything that's wrong with it from a security standpoint. Who can you trust? That's going to be our theme today. David? Um, David Escalante, I'm the Director of Computer Policy and Security at Boston College. Um, before that, I was thinking of doing an internet for like 25 years, which is kind of scary. But I worked at Old Veronica and Newman in Cambridge for years and years, doing uh, consulting for Fortune 500s. And Ian? Uh, Ian Mahoney, I'm an attorney at uh, Holland and Knight. Uh, my practice area focuses on intellectual property and e commerce issues. Okay. So we're going to look at this from several different perspectives. There's a theme. I'm going to talk about trust. Everybody remember the cartoon, 1993, Peter Steiner in the New Yorker. They showed the dog sitting at the, at the CRT, and he said, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Right? And so, so that talked about identity management and kind of associating an identity with an individual on the internet. Roll the clock forward, and what we're talking about today is really trust. When we talk about moving, putting, putting things into a cloud, what, what image does a cloud conjure up? A one of opa opacity, opaqueness. Um, you can't really see inside of it. And transparency is really what we're about as security people. We want to know how does something work, what you know measures are being taken to, to protect information. So we're going to be talking about what, what does it look like inside the cloud? How do we see inside the cloud? Um, how do we um, identify some of the risks? I mean, if you remember with risk, there's only three things you can do with risk. You can accept it. You can mitigate it, or you can transfer it. And we're, we're going to be, 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 be talking about that. So, so first, to, to start with, we've had several definitions this earlier today about what is a cloud. But, but I'd like to, to ask our panelists, because I know on our, on our phone discussions, we had some wide-ranging opinions that went even further than some of the earlier conversations we had. David, when, when people talk about the cloud, what, what does that mean to you? The cloud, to me, is uh supplying some kind of service, whether it's a platform or software or an application uh, at a virtual data center via the use of internet technologies. It's basically transferring your data center somewhere else uh, instead of having it inside where you have all the cost sets associated with it, whether it's personnel or utilities or floor space or what have you, where you're outsourcing that entire thing. But still not transferring the risk, keeping it internally because ultimately it is our responsibility. Okay. Matt? I think I would add to that, um, if you look at the, the history of uh, outsourcing um, uh, and technology, particularly in SaaS and on demand, it went from you know, sort of these big, large ITO contracts, IT outsourcing, we're literally taking, leasing someone else's data center to uh, ASPs where you have the early days of applications, uh, uh, which is uh, essentially one application being hosted, created and hosted by a, a third party, to Salesforce.com, which is software as a service, which is one application for many users. Uh, so I really ask the question, what's the difference between a cloud and a salesforce.com? I think it's really utility computing, the first stage of the utility computing where you have something that can be delivered as a service that can be dialed up and dialed down. Um, salesforce.com is not a, uh, a cloud, per se, it's delivered of the internet. But if you are starting to see um, utility services that can be dialed up and dialed down with significant capacity put behind it, to me that's, that's more cloud computing. Okay. David? Um, I think there's sort of a problem here because what technologists are talking about when they talk about cloud computing is different, I think, than people's regular perception, and that's an issue. Um, I think that to a technologist, this the new thing in cloud computing and why it needs a new buzzword and things like that, aside from the fact we get a new buzzword every couple of years, is more what was referred to this morning as um, infrastructure as a service or even platform as a service as people divide this stuff up, where it's like you can go get a sort of bare bones computer that's out there that you can turn on and turn off and only pay by the hour or the day or what have you for what you need. But that's a subtle technological distinction that I don't think people make in general. And I think that there's a bigger tendency if you've been 
looking at technology for years, people have been you know, going over the whiteboard and drawing a big cloud for anything that wasn't local, or even things that were local that you didn't understand. And when you talk about cloud computing to the great unwashed masses who aren't doing technology all day, every day, they don't think about this funny little technological definition. They just think about all the stuff that you've been drawing in clouds for 10 or 20 years because you've been drawing on the whiteboard. So I find it more convenient to talk about cloud in terms of what people understand, which is something that you don't have for Dave's definition and the more specific technological definition. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, it, you know, some years ago it was a rap idea back then, but the idea was that, that software <coughs> is the license. Um, I think lawyers said that, but in, in many ways, oh, the, the cloud, and it's, it's well spoken, the, the cloud is, is the contract. So that trust that you're talking about is defined in large part by the contract. Um, how opaque or how transparent the cloud is is defined by the contract. Now again, this, this is a very blinded view because there's other windows into what's inside that cloud, but that's another definition. Mm -hmm. All right, since we're speaking of that, if we think of the cloud then at potentially as a stack. And we heard a couple of different uh, dimensions to the stack. But if we think of it as a stack where I could be you know, with uh, Salesforce.com and, and getting a you know, high level application all the way down to buying ping power and pipe. Um, in terms of that contract and in terms of that definition, we'll start with Ian this time. Um, what, what's, how much more detail do you need to go in depending on where you are on the stack in terms of defining that, that contractual relationship? That, that's a great question. Um, but one thought is, is that if you're sort of at the infrastructure as a service level, um, that the types of components you're going to be worried about are going to be relatively simpler. As you go up the stack and you get up to software as a service, uh, uh, the potential for lock-in, uh, having all your data be stuck with the, the cloud service provider, mm -hmm. um, uh, those uh, risks increase dramatically. So as you go up the stack, <coughs> more and more of, of, of your own uh, uh, computing capacity is in the, in the cloud, uh, your risk increases, okay. or your potential risk. Okay. David Escalante, how do you do the due diligence on that? Um, is it reasonable for every potential consumer of a cloud-based service to you know, open up the Kimona and, and, and do the due, due diligence. I mean, how much can you trust others, and, and how much do you have to, you know, put your own fingers through the holes? Yeah, that's just a huge problem. <laughs> there, there isn't a good answer right now because it's a relatively immature market. But sort of tying off of the legal thing, when we get our um, contracting legal people involved in a cloud type of arrangement, they go, "Well, this must be like a computer or a software or something that I'm used to." And they pull out the old paradigm of are we going to put the software in escrow and what's going to be in the contract for this and where's the data going to be stored and all the things that the cloud provider can't actually utilize their economies of scale and deliver services to hundreds and hundreds of customers with a custom contract for every single customer. And there's just a big issue there in terms of how you want to go deal with that. And uh, that isn't sorted out yet. I think where we need to go long term is some sort of set of agreed upon procedures or standards or things to hold people to, and there are some efforts that are starting both among the legal community and the technical community to do that sort of thing. A, a particular favorite of mine is a group called Shared Assessments, which you guys are probably familiar with mm -hmm. from the financial services, but the financial services companies have gotten together, and I think their website is called something easy to remember, like sharedassessments.org or something like that. Um, to basically have a big list of questions that you would want to ask an outside service provider. And the idea is if the outside service provider can fill out that list of questions and everyone sort of agrees it's a reasonable list of questions, they don't have to do a new worksheet for a reasonable customer. And you get something that's backed by years of research and editing. I think they're on version 5 or something like that but for the financial services industry of what you want to ask somebody before you go to give them data. So I think we can get there. Matt, you and Veracode are thought leaders in this space. You see what it looks like from the other side, where people are coming to you saying, give me an attestation that if I send you my program to be analyzed, that you're going to keep it securely and so forth. Um, what are some of the, uh, what's some practical advice you could give the people in this room as potential consumers of cloud services of kind of what to ask for and what are some of your best practices? Yeah, it's just tough. I mean, it's uh, I have both views of the world coming from Symantec and then being a CEO of a small company. But um, I think it's around trying to uh, make sure what you ask for passes a Google test, right? And I think there's an important point here where 
And even though you're outsourcing the cloud, you're maintaining 100% of the liability. Mm -hmm. Even if you can have contractual shared liability, still brand liability, 100% is you know, whatever organization you're with. Um, what Veracode has to do um, is, so we have banks flying over from Barclays and you know, Goldman Sachs coming on site to kick the tires, is that we've actually sacrificed on some of the shared uh, economics of the cloud because we don't outsource anything. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have the vulnerability information of some of the world's largest companies, and so we have to make sure that only uh, you know, no foreign nationals are touching any code. You know, so we don't outsource to India or China or that. So we do the standard list of things, so getting SAS 70 uh, certified, SysTrust certified, visible seals that means something in the various vertical markets that we play with. And as a small company, take that extra step, you know, albeit more costly, to ensure that uh, we went over the trust of the, of the customer. In some cases, that trust level is higher for, for some than others. Uh, but um, you know, I think actually shared assessment is an interesting example, even though they're on version five. I don't know many people that actually use it. It's yeah. true, because it's too, it's too onerous. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's not 100 questions, it's like 1,400 questions. Right. So yeah. I think it's around just making sure that you uh, I feel like you're dealing with a, a respectable service provider that is going to jump through hoops if something happens, because something invariably will happen, not being so close <coughs> that you break the economics of outsourcing. Mm -hmm. okay. David is a former colleague who went from the financial services, highly regulated space where we had some control over things, to a university environment which people liken to um, cat herding. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you actually went through the experience of, of outsourcing student email to Google Apps. Yes, we did. Can you tell us about what some of the due diligence was like when you went through that? It, uh, the discussion started actually in 2008. Um, and I heard someone say in 2008, welcome to the year of cloud computing. And I said, you know, we heard welcome to the year of PKI, welcome to the year of identity <laughs> management for like 13 years. But really, 2008 was the year of cloud computing. And we saw a momentum going not only in the industry, but also in the university to cut costs because uh, we had a mandate to cut costs. And I started thinking about it early. And to everyone's point from the last question, I said, well, we'll do our regular internal risk assessment, and then we'll outsource a risk assessment to a third party and kind of meet in the middle. And as Dennis said, opening the kimono for these places was not that easy. Uh, found out that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, they were going to give us a precious little, and that was about it. But we did lean on a little bit of the Cloud, Cloud Security Alliance. It was on version two of their guidance, and also just released a paper about what they think of emerging threats in the cloud. And I at least had something that was not quite an industry standard, but was leading towards it. Both consumer and the security and the cloud people were working on it. And we did have to go through many, many rounds of the contracts with Google. Um, we wanted to certify that it was as safe as being in our data center, and recognizing there was going to be some risk. It took a lot of selling through our legal counsel, through our chief auditor, through our corporation members. Uh, we think we've done about the best due diligence as we possibly can. We've been very comfortable. Now, that's just student email. We're thinking about doing it for faculty, staff, medical, and research, too. Whole another ball game. Now we're wondering, you know, where is the data going to be sitting? If we have contracts with NSA or with, uh, you know, with the government, it has to be on a U.S. server. They can't guarantee that. So I think the risk assessment and the, uh, the due diligence is going to be a lot deeper than, than it was just for the students. Okay, I'd like to go back to Ian on that. Um, there are things that you can do when you have services in-house related to things like e-discovery, uh, expectations of privacy, um, uh, the, you know, your, your ability to uh, research things uh, on behalf of law enforcement or, or legal. Um, from, a, from a contractual standpoint, uh, how much of that is negotiable? And, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, should you, um, I mean, people, here, here's a situation with universities. Google gives away Google Apps to universities. So it's a tremendous motivation. You know, it's hard to argue with free. So people want to jump in with both feet. And I'm going back to our folks and saying, whoa, whoa slow, slow down. Um, do you understand what the consequences of the things that we used to be able to do that we're no longer able to do? Um, do you have some, some, some thoughts on, on that and, and guidance you could give us? Yeah. Yes, the, the, the issue about how negotiable the contracts is is a, is a key issue. Uh, and, and one thought is that the more commoditized uh, the structure is, the, the simpler it is to get in and get out, the, the, obviously the, the less negotiable the contract is. Um, and the thought would be that, that if there is this transparency, so it's easy for me as a consumer to figure out contract A, contract B, contract C, and, and tell the differences, then rather than have the contracts be negotiable, I can just choose between providers based on what the contract is. Um, the problem right now is that contracts are fairly impenetrable. 
and, and even the negotiating part. You know, Dave, like you were saying, and Dave, like you were saying, the negotiating part is 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 wrong. Mm -hmm. And and pointing to standards is is not necessarily the, although it's a nice idea that they're not, you know, modularized quite yet. So you can point out to them and, and remove ten pages or whatever it might be from the mm -hmm. contract. Uh, and those hidden risks, in other words, the, the abstraction, uh, so you don't really know where the, your data is, uh, the risks that uh, you know, you're stored in Brazil or in Italy or in Belgium, all countries where uh, the, the data protection authorities have said, we have, our law enforcement has access to this data regardless of the personal information or trade secrets or whatever, um, that's, a, that's a, a, a large risk. And if you're presented with a non-negotiable adhesion contract, in other words, take it or leave it, uh, and you're not sure what that risk is, that can be problematic. And that, that's, a, that's a big impediment to uh, opening up the ground. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we've heard from Matt as a provider on to be compliant with places like Barclays and, and, and so forth, um, you having to uh, uh, do it yourself and, 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 and not, not outsource um, that, 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 um, those sort of things. What other expectations have you gotten from, uh, for, from customers that would be showstoppers in terms of moving something to the cloud? Well, it's really, ironically, it even begins with the people. Um, at our company, we're very, very careful in who we hire, and the trust model has to be there. If we, the security industry is, is full with, uh, you know, it's called you know, black hats and white hats, right, and the white right, hats right. are the good guys, the black hats, and so uh, a lot of them cross over between worlds. Uh, those are great, great hats, hats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the opportunistic hats, you know, whatever. Yeah. Maybe. Um, uh, but we have to be very, very careful. Uh, there's some very, a lot of talent we can't hire, and so everything we do here. Uh, at Verica really is around maintaining the trust model no matter what it is, whether it's people, process, or, or technology. Right. We were talking about that before. That it's not just the technology, it's also the, the, the people in the process. And you as a small company with, with high value customers, you may be willing to reveal you know, more of that. Uh, Dave Escalante, if, if you went to uh, Google or some other cloud provider, uh, how much do you think you could learn about how they vet their people and who's actually running your applications? and and uh, you know, what, what, what would the bar be for you in terms of wanting to play or not? Um, in general, not a lot, to give you a short answer. And, uh, <laughs> the uh, Cloud Security Alliance, as uh, was referred to earlier by somebody, so there's a group called the Cloud Security Alliance that's trying to produce papers and things like that with issues about um, what you might want to think about in security when you're doing the cloud thing. And I think that first level of effort is like 70 pages long or something or other, a list of all the things you want to think about. They just came out with something in the last couple of weeks that's like a top 10 list of things you would want to worry about. And one of the things that all the folks from all the different companies, including cloud providers, were involved in that was that very issue. What do you do to possibly vet who's working for the company who you just gave your data to? And what assurances can they provide you that they've done any reasonable level of checking and continue on an ongoing basis to do a reasonable level of checking? Okay. Um. Again, from a risk, and I ask this to uh, uh, do a shirt, from a risk management standpoint, we always talk about accepting risk, mitigating risk, or transferring risk. Um, what are your thoughts? Have you heard of any places where you could get you know, insurance or some kind of you know, indemnification risk transfer to, to, to uh, somebody else for applications that move out of, out of your own environment? Sure, it's funny, it was within weeks after signing the Google contract that we started getting contact from cyber insurance risk uh, companies to see if that we wanted to outsource some of our uh, liabilities there. And we're taking a, a long look at that if we move to the faculty and the staff and the research. With the students, we felt like the uh, liability was rather small. Mm -hmm. um, they're, mandated, they're on a completely separate network. They're mandated not to have you know, Brown University confidential data on there. Computers, we don't really care how many AIM friends they have. Um, so we're not really looking at it that way, but I do think uh, because of Google, they're really making a push. As Dennis said, they're giving it to us for free for four years. Uh, one of the corporation members asked me, well, what happens after four years if they want to pull that feet to the fire? And I said, we can't predict that four years. I mean, if we look back four years, we, you know, things were completely different anyway. Um, but as we... Some of us will be retired. So. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us will be retired, so that's even a bigger risk because I want to do the it. But um, no, we are looking definitely that, you know, if we can work, we seem to be able to work with Google. I, they were very anxious for us to come on board. They were looking for customers. They were looking for large, reputable schools to come on board. They were very open with us with contracts and being able to change some things. 
We look at their hiring practices, all the same things we would do. And they've even said that they would work with us in working with cyber insurance to come up with an acceptable policy that they would feel comfortable with, uh, a notif breach notifications, e-discovery notifications, what have you. So we're certainly looking at that. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. Yeah. Matt, you had, uh, when we talked about this, and I mentioned SLAs, you said, no, 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 we use SLOs. And it was very different. Would you describe that for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, so SLAs, uh, service level agreements, are uh, typically um, you know, uh, set of um, conditions that you agree to meet as a service provider, and there's typically teeth or hooks in a contract. You know, so it's actually an ironclad agreement. SLOs, service level objectives, are you know, transparent objectives you set as a company to hit. And so, for instance, uh, Verico today operates in SLOs because there's a lot of gray around the type of service we do. And so we, we uh, have a service level objective to get uh, really two things. One, uh, an application back to within 24 to 72 hours. Well, people have uh, increasingly found out about what we can do and have gone from sending us 50,000 lines of code to turn around uh, to they said something came in this weekend and there was 100 million lines of code they wanted us to get through in that same period. So we're getting better, we're actually getting through it. But you can't, you know, we can't commit to getting through every type of code uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as we would a small mobile app. Uh, and then two is uh, we actually commit to an objective of, of the quality of our results, which is uh, we have something called false positive rates of 15% mm -hmm. or less, sometimes we get down to zero. But it's a ban because in that particular case, the customer's definition of what a false positive might be may be different than right. us as an expert. Right. So you have to build in wiggle room so you, as a small company, you don't go and uh, have large companies to, you know, exercising contractual obligations that still make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where our large customers understand that what we can do is so much better and that what they can do themselves, given the difference in core competence, right. that they're comfortable with that until we mature as a business and can put you know, financial hooks in the contract. I can't remember which one of you it was, but one of you said when um, going to your CEO with, a, or your, your president with, a, with one of these, they said, I only have a couple of questions, and one of them is, what is our exit strategy? And I thought that was a brilliant question. Um, Dave, Dave Escalante, what do you, what do you think in terms of um, when you get into an agreement like this in, in, in terms of an exit strategy? These are all great questions because they're problematic, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually an easy job today. <laughs> the, uh, a lot of the companies that are in this space are new companies that are startups that may or may not succeed because we talk about the number of new innovative companies that don't succeed. So what happens when you either have some business process that's been automated that's running on a server, irrespective of the amount of data behind it, or a customer interface or something like that, and then the company goes out of business? Or if you actually put data out in the cloud and the company goes out of business, how do you get your data back? Um, and there aren't really as good answers as there ought to be. You ought to put something in the contract or see if there's something in the contract, but there's no guarantee if a company is a chapter seven that you're just gone as opposed to chapter 11. If somebody declares chapter seven and they're gone and they turn the servers off, there's no guarantee that you necessarily are gonna get that stuff back. So some people feel more comfortable using an IBM or an Amazon or whoever, even if the price is a little higher on the theory, that they're not gonna fail, but beyond reputational things or looking at size or things like that that you normally do, there isn't really a great way to get things back, even if you were to put it in a contract. If the data is stored on machines in another country and the company goes out of business and the machines disappear, forget it. It doesn't matter if you have a contract. Um, Ian, your thoughts on that? I, I agree, and I think that the exit strategy is, is a, key, a key component. So for example, Dave, when you're talking about you know, Google Apps for four years, then what happens? Mm -hmm. you know, that's where you want your exit strategy to kick in so you really know what will happen. Um, getting the data back is, is tricky. There's the, the, the technical end of getting it back and then the legal end. Um, many uh, the cloud service providers, you know, Amazon, for example, will say if, if you're in breach, and, and that's a, a key component, in other words, uh, if uh, David and I have a contract and, and I'm the 800 pound gorilla, I can say, oh, you know, you, you've looked at me wrong, you're in breach. So Amazon says, if you're in breach, uh, we don't have to give you your data back and we don't have to be sure that you can retrieve it. We'll just terminate the agreement. So that, that's an example where uh, uh, if I'm the 800 pound gorilla, I have huge leverage over David because if I say he's in breach, I, I have to hold this data hostage. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the areas where you want to negotiate hard to get that legal protection the technical protection about maybe having periodic downloads, monitoring or auditing, those kinds of things can be baked into the contract as well, but that's a trickier area. Mm -hmm. David Sherry, um, 
the, the question of, of who you're going to call. Um, uh, we're, we're already thinking about this because we're Brandeis is also looking at moving students to uh, to, to Google Apps, mm -hmm. and, and everybody's in favor of it until there's any sort of anomalous situation, an outage, mm -hmm. a slowdown, and then and then who are you going to call? And we started looking at it, and there are websites you can go to and say, "Yep, we're having a problem," and and, and, and so forth. But uh, people are accustomed at universities and at most Fortune I mean, 500 companies. And when something happens, they scream and IT jumps. Sure. Okay. If there's an outage now, what recourse do you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Google won't jump. That's for sure. <laughs> um, or the earth would shake if they did. I mean, yeah. Our first line of defense is still our internal help desk. We did not contract with Google's help services. We still wanted our students and our faculty and staff. Well, they were not any yet, but the students to call our internal help desk. Uh -huh. uh, beyond that, we have second line of support that we can call to Google with a certain response time, and then we have a third line of support with a certain response time. What we did was we baked into our overall incident response policy a Google path that if we think we're having a slowdown, if we think we're having downtime. We did have one issue of downtime, and uh, we put our plan into place. We contacted Google. They had some speed bumps that they had to uh, overcome the first time, but we think they're getting better at it. Um, that is an issue because, as you stated, if they call our internal help desk, central IT is all over it, no matter what time of the day it is. We've got the people coming in and we're going to get it fixed. Google, it, not so. So we could not get an SLA or an SLO. I, I'm going to use that on them the next time. Um, we could not get them, but we did get that escalated line of support that if we don't think we're getting the right answers, there's only certain people that can call those certain numbers and uh, they will answer. But so far, the one response that we had to get, they were okay. And students are pretty forgiving. Um, it would have to get more stringent if we moved to faculty and staff. Yes. Can I have just a question to yeah, sure. clarify? Uh, are you saying that Google did not know they were down until you called them? Uh, I believe they knew they were down. Okay. They did not. Re they did not have their plans in place to respond accurately to what we agreed to do with them. Was it something yeah, about internal about, response? Was it something about sort of a uh, part of their infrastructure was down, a part that. In, in, that involved what they were serving you? It was in their load balancing. Okay. It was in their load balancing. These are dedicated uh, data centers that they use for Google Apps for Education. It's not like the public consumer Gmail. And it was in their load balancing between two different centers. So they were having an issue on. So certain people were not being able to get to their mail at a forgiven amount of time. Thanks. We have similar things that in evaluating it ourselves. I mean, we're accustomed at a university to blocking email when necessary, and also uh, making sure that if email gets accidentally blocked, if there's a false positive, that you know, like a, maybe some faculty member at another institution w was on a spam list, mm -hmm. and, and, and they get blocked, we'll explicitly you know, let them in at the request of a faculty member. In talking to you know, a provider like Google, they said, you get what everybody else gets. Um, so, so you know the change in expectation. Nothing is free, and uh, you know managing uh, expectations is a real issue. Um, uh, David Escalante, um, we both worry a lot about uh, the th we, we call the three R's of risk: regulations, revenues, and reputation. Right? And, and the regulations, Massachusetts 201 CMR 17, went into effect on, on the first, and it specifically describes how we have to handle. Uh, confidential information of Massachusetts residents. When people have access to things like Google Docs, and you can put anything you want um, out, out in the cloud, how do we control that? I mean, how, you know, how, how do we manage that, both from, a, from an institutional standpoint and, and, and also from a student standpoint? Uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent on that. Please do. <laughs> um, do a rant. I think one, one, of the, one of the issues with the whole cloud thing is I'm not actually against cloud computing, but cloud computing people will come up and they'll tell you, we'll do this cheaper, we'll do it faster, more quickly, we'll do it more flexibly, and possibly more securely. And if you just put those words together in your head, forget about whether you know anything about security <laughs> or not, how many things are faster and cheaper and more flexible and more secure? I mean, does that work when you go to withdraw money from the bank? Send your mother, send your brother, send uh, your neighbor. Does it work when you're trying to you know, secure your house or some valuable or something like that? It generally doesn't work. And what's happening in a whole range of things is in the consumer market, or the case that we cite of someone can whip out their credit card and go rent a server or 
by a server at Staples or by a PDA at Staples or by the their cellular store or whatever. People don't walk in caring about security. They care that they saw an ad that said, you know, it's $79 a month instead of $99 a month, right? So there's no incentive in the mass market, and I'm counting cloud computing as a mass market to make things more secure. Mm -hmm. People are looking at other factors, and if you're putting things into those devices or into the cloud or something like that that needs to be secure, you're nuts if you don't spend a lot of time making sure that the people who are you're trusting your information with actually spend some time on security because they're none of them are incented economically to do that. So the question I think in a broader sense, getting back to your question, is are there things we need to do societally to take care of that? The reason you see all these crazy data regulations and things like that that Dennis mentioned is because we lost data. There are not bunches of people sitting around in the mass legislature or Congress or whatever going, Let's see, I think maybe data security is important, we'll pass some regulations, and then people will have to do more work. They read things in the newspaper, you lost 50 million records, and I lost 45 million records, and et cetera, et cetera, and they go, geez, this is a disaster, all these businesses are losing records, we have to, make, we have to regulate them, right? So there may actually be some incentive at some level if some of these agreements aren't worked out in terms of the security of cloud computing or mobile computing or some of the rest of the things for us to say societally we need to set some minimal bar of what people who sell these services need to do much the way we're getting regulated with NIT and other areas in order to offer a service or else they can be litigated against. Yeah, and as a litigator, what are your thoughts on that? He'd love it. Of course, sir, he's going to buy me dinner. He's going to go to Hawaii. Um, uh, well, one thought is, it is the case that, that you know, incentive in the mass market is this sort of a race to the bottom. Um, and, and one thought, we talked about this at lunch, about looking at, at the cloud or looking at the internet generally as a public good, and sort of the role of legislatures to do the right thing and set minimum, minimum bars. Uh, I'm not sure that 201 CMR Section 17, so the new Massachusetts regulation, the WISP, the Written Information Security yeah, yeah, Program, yeah. the WISP, I, I'm not sure that does it quite. Um, but, uh, in, in part, uh, the, the remedies under WISP are, are only the Attorney General can bring an action. So, so in other words, I, I'm, I'm completely asleep and all the data is just floating out. I'm like Swiss cheese and poor David is, is harmed terribly. He can't sue me. He needs to go to the attorney general and get her to sue me. So it's it's a it's a step removed. Mm -hmm. um, having a civil action, uh, so anybody could sue me. Anybody could be a private attorney general would would raise the bar. So for example, the EPIC is suing Google uh, for the Google breaches, but it's through the FTC. So it's a similar regulatory enforcement rather than a private individual. So what, what is EPIC? Um, it's the Electronic Privacy. Information, something or other. I can, yeah, yeah. I, I can give you the uh, the, the precise. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I can give you a website. Gordon, are we missing an outlet? I mean, like I, I heard one of the gentlemen just say, people don't care about security. Can we fix stupid? No, we can just. <laughs> no, 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 I, no I'm just, there may be an opportunity here because no, I mean, so you just said, and I think you know, because this is these are entrepreneurs in the room, and we said it's like. They are not willing. They want. They, they just want to cheat. You know, it's a ninety to seven. You know, they will give away their DNA for like you know a, a Starbucks coupon and that type of thing. And so, like, how did you guys get this, this crummy job of trying to keep them from like just uh, damaging themselves? Well, I mean, isn't there an opportunity to say like, here's the deal? I mean, like, you you, you get free connectivity, but you know, like, you're you're, you're totally naked. Well, I think that's a really tricky thing that Dennis and I <laughs> disagree on. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you do your side, not do mine. Uh, in general. It's an opportunity, yeah, from an innovative innovation perspective, because think about cars. People didn't wear seat belts, people didn't buy the airbags, people didn't buy the anti-lock brakes when all this stuff was available. Pay us another thousand dollars, we'll make you more secure. Mass market, didn't happen. It'll save your life. Forget about saving your data or your password or whatever the hell. I mean, you can just look around. People don't buy people don't go to special stores and buy special locks for the doors. They go by the one at Home Depot where the guy already can break into it, you know, in fifteen seconds. It doesn't happen. But that isn't to say. So why is that? You know, they care about their lives. But, but over time, it does happen. Yeah. But the, what really? happened was the government ended up having to say you have to make automatic seatbelts in the cars. You have well, to. Was, it was like two big markets. So like if you look it. back, we're sort of in a similar situation where you know, I think we make gross generalizations about security. Uh, yeah. Yeah. People do care about security. The problem is how they fund it. And um, U.S. corporations, just in general, don't do a good job at security. So that they're very thought of. My outsource is going to do a better job. It's in many cases the outsource is like you can't do it. Why should I do it? Right. You know, it's one of those latent yeah. things that needs to go into mm -hmm. what we do. 
If you look at the automobile industry in the 1970s, um, the, all, every, almost every car accident that took place in the 70s was funded by insurance companies. Yeah. Right? And then the National Highway Transport, uh, Transportation and Safety Act was passed, and all of a sudden insurance companies went and bought cars, put plastic thumbies in them, crashed them. Yeah, it's not the driver's fault, it's the actual cars don't work, you know, and then right. bake it in. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's how markets move, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's not really much about the consumer. The consumer cares about their lives. The question is affordability, risk, and things of that nature. And I think when it comes to, you know, I get a recall from Jeep the other day, actually, a lot of people was in Toyota, but it basically <laughs> said to me, I thought it was fascinating, it was sort of applied to what we're trying to do at Verica, but it said, there's a flaw in the software in your Jeep. If you drive up a hill of a certain grade at a certain speed, your brakes will fail. And <laughs> 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 I was getting on a plane to go to Europe, and it was a busy time of the year. And I said, you know, so many hills, you know, uh, you know, I'm highly likely that I'm not going to get in this accident. Right. This is, in fact, the flaw they're telling me about. Mm -hmm. But I also said I wouldn't buy that car if I knew about it, even if the same probability existed when I was in the lot looking at the car. Sure. So it comes back to transparency. Yeah. Yeah. It comes yeah. down to education. Yeah. But I, but I would submit that we're better off, you know, buying services from your company to try to make sure that the application is more secure, or buying security software or hardware or something like that, than trying to make people read the thing that came in the mail that they throw in the garbage can and then put them in the envelope. And this is this is where you know. <laughs> but, but that, that, oh, I'm sorry. That, that is the case though. That, that you know, that at least the privacy regime here in the states is a notice-based regime. So the idea is, yeah. if I tell you what I'm going to do with your data, if you say yes, it's fine. All bets are off. I can do whatever I feel like it. And the idea is, again, with sort of we don't care about security. Is that notice enough? Should there be a baseline where I can't consent to being a complete idiot? We have, so. a, we have a curriculum at the university called Digital Self-Defense. And we teach it to faculty, staff, and students as part of the digital literacy. And, and the premise of it is, is we try to use the WIFM model. What's in it for me? So if you're teaching it to a student, you're teaching them how to avoid having to pay the RAA $3,000 for an MP3, right? If you're teaching it to uh, a staff member, um, you, you, you're teaching them about protecting their own information. David and, and David and myself, we've been doing a lot of scanning of machines on campus looking for PII, personally identifiable information. It only clicks with people when they see their own personally identifiable information on the machine. You say, well, if there were a breach, not only the stuff that you shouldn't have had there in the first place will go out, but your stuff is going to go out too. Suddenly that registers because, you know, it, it, students are particularly narcissist, narcissistic and, you know, it, it, it's all about them, but faculty and, 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 and staff are too. Um, you know, that, that it's a personal risk to them. We will help you to learn how to operate more safely. Security is people, process, and technology. Bruce Schneier has that famous quotation that if you believe that technology can solve all your security problems, you don't understand the problems and you don't understand the technology. Okay, and it's really, really true. So um, a lot of what we're doing now is, is trying to change this uh, sort of careless behavior. And that, and that goes right into something we, we talked about at lunch that I want to ask Matt about. With an iPhone, there are 140,000 applications that are available for the iPhone, okay? Application insecurity is one of the major vulnerabilities that we see in terms of patching and everything else. So when I go to iTunes, how much do I know about how safe those applications are that may ask me to key in personally identifiable information? Matt, what, what is being done to to help secure that, because to me, that's just an accident waiting to happen. No, it is, and it, it, the world is getting, the mess is getting bigger and, and better, really, when you think about it. So, you know, um, all these big companies like Google and uh, um, uh, Apple and uh, any really platform provider is competing based on ecosystems. Mm -hmm. You know, and the ecosystem in this particular case is the iPhone app developers. And so, uh, arguably, there's you know, other developers, uh, other uh, mobile phones out there with better experience than Apple, but they just have the most content. So mm -hmm. nothing's being done to slow down the proliferation of the ecosystem. And what's happening is, uh, if you look at the Google, uh, the Chinese attack on Google, it wasn't even that sophisticated. No. An attack was clever. Yeah. It was spear it, fishing. Yeah. It, yeah. But it actually took advantage of a vulnerability in software, and it was a top ten was a top ten vulnerability. Right. Yeah. So um, this is a big mess, and I think what you're going to see is attention start to develop where. Um, there will be some uh, scanning done on applications before they enter the, the uh, app store uh, to protect consumers because what's happening is these devices don't have 
uh, a lot of the client side um, security technology on them. You know, McAfee and, and Symantec and others are largely absent uh, on these devices. And so um, it's really going to be around not just do you trust Google, not just do you trust the product, but you actually trust whether the product is good or not. Mm -hmm. and I think you're going to start seeing product liability um, starting to take place. But it's hard because again, consumers want stuff. You know, so I think the, in order to provide that level of security, which historically has been an insurance sale, right, it's right. going to be cheap and easy, just like any other product that you want to get consumed. David? And there's, there's disincentive to build security in right now and so, some uh, platforms. If you would think of the big monster in Redmond, Washington that sits on a lot of our desktops, they could build code more securely and wait a little while before they roll it out. But the burden to fix it is on the end user. We have to, we have, to have a firewall. We have to have... Uh, antivirus, we have to download the patches and upgrade it. All the burden is on us. So where's where's the incentive for the company to, to build the security in? They exactly. Well, no, that's exactly right. I mean, this is a market incentive thing because I remember, you know, Ralph's agenda is in there through a tirade up in Red, right? Yeah. You know, you know, outside the garage door of the Gagemeister, right? He yeah. says, when are you going to start, start making code that, you know, you can, that you'll indemnify me for? Right? And he says, you know, when are you going to stop buying the crap that I'm building now? <laughs> There's a, there's a big difference on this and this, and I, and I love semantic, right? So I, I, I sort of have, uh, unfortunately, intimate knowledge of how this stuff get, happens. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so semantic uh, made a public statement at the last uh, financial services uh, roundtable I was at. It was all about third-party risk. And semantic got up there and said, 25% uh, of our vulnerabilities come from third parties. Was, like, was that good or bad? 75% come internally, right? Software engineers don't write secure code. It's, it's, it's a different type of engineering discipline to think about how this feature should work and how it should work under attack. And the economics of software don't promote that. So uh, this is Microsoft, this is the irony. Microsoft has spent more money and more time than any company on the planet ever will trying to write secure code. And the Chinese attack on Microsoft was a top 10 vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It wasn't number 19 or 20 or 21 or 22. It was something that should have been caught by their system. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, there's a real cause issue here, I think, around uh, people at the end of the day that are creating technology. Yeah. Sometimes it's really easy to build security in, lock, put a lock on, you can't get in unless I let you in. Other cases, it's very, very different because the subtleties of security, are, um, uh, the economics of security don't favor the economics of business. Mm -hmm. Like it's insurance plan today. Yeah. Um, Ian, are you seeing anything in terms of, of liability changes? Uh, going to the, the, the person who actually produced the product or service? Uh, well, the product liability issue, I think, is an interesting one. And, and the, again, sort of that idea of uh, litigation driving uh, uh, heightened standards. So, you know, the, the, the example of the auto industry and, and the crashes. Um, most uh, warranties are disclaimed. So cloud service providers will disclaim as much as they can. And, and the service levels or the SLOs uh, may bring something back in, but oftentimes the remedy for uh, a, a breach of the SLA is a performance credit or some just little stick, but not the big hammer of I'm going to sue you for mm -hmm. everything you're worth. Uh, so uh, that issue about warranties, product liability um, is, is evolving, and it's pretty, it's pretty soft right now. So. Um, you've listened to us, and, and it's rare that you get four people like this together. Any um, questions from, from the, the, the people in the room? Yes? Yeah, I have one. Um, so I was thinking about the exit strategy before you mentioned it, and I was thinking also about sort of how we should evaluate the risk. So you talked about the three R's, yeah, yeah. and in our environment, you know, the, um, sometimes it's difficult to talk about the lost revenue. You know, what, and, and I think one of you, I think you mentioned that, so projecting four years out is hard, right? So what will it cost us to exit out of this service and, and let's say do it ourselves again? That's an unknown. As well as, you know, how, how long will that take us? Because every day or every hour is gonna cost so many millions of dollars. So um, how have you guys dealt with that? And what would you recommend? evaluating that risk? Well, we know exactly how much it was costing us to run our Microsoft Exchange infrastructure. And we bumped that up against Google and then ran that out to a, a five-year projection. Not the four-year, the five years to see what, what it would cost us. And it made s monetary sense to make the jump to Google right now, uh, given what the economy did to our endowment and the cuts that we were mandated to make, it just made absolute monetary sense. The question that I was concerned about, or the corporation said, well, what about four years from now? 
we don't know what the next new product will be. We don't know what the next new innovative technology will be. We don't even know if we'll even be considering moving to Google and transforming somewhere else. Accepting the risk with just the students was easy because the students churn every yeah. every 12 months. We get 1,600 new hackers that come to school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's going to be a much. It's going to be. It's going to be. A, somebody asked me when I. No, I, you, I understand you've got your firewall. You know, you should keep them out. You're trying to keep them in. Is that right? <laughs> we, we have a colleague from Colombia. He says his job is to protect the world from Colombia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now. If we do decide to consider faculty and staff, that's when that model will come in. Well, what is going to be our exit strategy? How will we get this back? What will we need to supply for our infrastructure? We didn't really have to consider that so much with the students. It was an easy decision because we can cut it off and don't have to worry about them coming back. So the, uh, I'm with you there. I guess uh, to get real specific on that, um, I look at it as so once we get out of the service, right? Mm -hmm. So you can cost out what it's costing us now, right. okay? And then get out. Well, if I'm going to get back in, I have startup costs. Sure. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that that's going to build in. Plus, it's an unknown as to exactly what I'm going to have to invest. You in. almost need to escrow the money if, yeah, if, if, that, if you're going to get back into it. Because otherwise, you're going to have this huge incremental mm -hmm. OpEx hit or, or CapEx hit the year that you do it. Yeah. Right. We, we have the framework for that. Mm -hmm. We know what the utilities will cost. We know what the floor space will cost, the cooling, and all that. We don't know what the technology will be, right. what the solution will be. Yeah. And but there's also, but four years, yeah, I love your idea of four years out. We don't even know, centrally, for the, one of the big things that we didn't talk about in the disruption is the consumerization of IT. Yeah. I mean, because are we going to, what is the role of a central IT organization in a world where they've already, they're so overly provisioned on their own? Right. What are we going to? Well, I mean, if, if, if you work in a university, my, uh, one of the reasons I went to Brandon, it's an interesting job. My, the chief librarian is my peer. So the technology and library services are together. Look at a library. It's the same thing. Students come on campus. Right? For the first, two years ago, for the first time, we had students come on campus who had never used a card catalog. Think about that. Never used a card catalog in the library. We told them they had to plug in their machine with an RJ45 to register on, on the network. They had never used a wired connection. I mean, to, to, to them, the, the, the whole world was wireless. right? So, I mean, it's a totally, totally different mindset. Librarians are going through the same thing as IT people, saying, what services does it make sense for us to provide? And, and with, with, with all this consumerization, four years from now, you know, the IT department may not even e exist in anything looking anywhere like it looks right now. Uh, Ian? Yeah, actually, just on the, on the on <clears throat> exit strategy as well, a, a lot of sort of the old learning, you know, non-cloud learning about vendor lock-in would apply here as well, but you need to update it. So we talked about escrows and not really working anymore. Um, but one component, too, is if you've got your, uh, the, your, your, your platform, uh, whatever it is, working happily with cloud service provider X, um, uh, you're going to want to make sure also that sort of your intellectual property, your derivative works, the, the, the fun hooks you have uh, into their APIs, you can pull that with you. So there's a, a number of different ways to make sure that you're, you're as portable as can be, um, because again, that's going to give you leverage. So at the end of that four years, you may want to stay with Google, but you sure as heck want to have the max amount of leverage to say, geez, man, I, I could leave you in a heartbeat, so, so be nice to me kind of thing. So. In think about the inverse, you know, to yeah, coming from the service trying. provider. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm trying to do, what, what's great about, yeah, I guess, from a consumer standpoint of the cloud is that, you know, in some cases there's no switching costs, right? And, and hypothetically, in some, some services you can just give someone a new URL and you're done, right? You, you're, you're done with service provider A. So I think about this, I mean, I like what is renewals, you know, subscriptions that come up for renewal, we have to renew. So, um, and stocks trade on annuity streams, so that's, I mean, capital markets run on lifetime value of customer for the most part. And so I try to think about how I can get my hooks into IT departments so that they can't get out of them. Right? So these are the switching costs that I've been doing very careful. So I'll give you an example of our service. You can upload, you can upload an, uh, an application to the cloud one at a time, right? But I'm pushing my development team to is create hooks into the internal systems of companies' source control systems so they go automatically every time someone, you know, uh, anytime someone, um, uh, it makes a change in code, it comes to Garfield automatically without anyone looking at it. So you're part of the workflow, yeah. You're part of the workflow. So anytime you download software, right, anytime you take something else, post that first contract, be careful because it typically is a hook into your internal processes, your systems that are tough to unglue. And that's sort of the, the, the you know, if you have a good trusted service provider, you want to do more, 
you go to Salesforce.com's website, you'll see more systems integrators yeah. on the front page. And they say, no, software is dead. They're just creating their own software to block you into Salesforce.com. And so it's those folks that I think make it hard to switch and your cost, your unknown costs go up. If I may, uh, thank you very much for that. You got, you got just convinced me through all of this that this is not a financial decision in my mind. Because to mitigate the risk, the escrow is a great idea. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. theory, it's a, I think it's about poor competency. The opportunity cost of McDonald's to have people spend time on this versus spend time building the business, it's not worth it. So we have a stronger sell internally saying, hey, that's not our core competence. It's not what we're about. That doesn't drive value in the business. We need it. Right. We want it and, and all of that. There's a stronger sales case for that, I believe. You know, there's also somebody said too, there's a comment around, you know, security, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, don't expect cloud security providers. In many cases, I would say 99 out of 100 times, we do what we do more securely than yeah, any enterprise yeah, could ever do. Sure. And so, you know, you ask someone, how, are you protecting your source control system so that, you know, you didn't get hacked like the Chinese? No, they're not, right? and we are. And so I think in some cases, I mean, that's exactly what it comes down to. If I can't win the, you know, the TCO, the ROI, basically saying, hey, you're a, you're a, ham a hamburger manufacturer. If I can't convince you to outsource, you know, you know, code checks, I got a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Should be a lot, I'm probably gonna tell you something, you know, so I think you're right. We said this great mantra at Thompson, I work for Thompson, the Inter uh, International uh, Information Publisher, and we used to say, Disney doesn't outsource the theme parks, right? And if you look at what are your core competencies as a business, focus on them. The stuff that's only conspicuous by its absence, um, that's the stuff that, that you really should should think about Move, moving to somebody for whom that's their core competence. What, what was it? The end of the 90s, beginning of 2000. Everybody would tell you your CIO is your strategic partner, and your your security practices and how you did IT was going to be competitive edge. So do you lose that edge? And do you lose that differentiation? Well, we heard, we, well, 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 we, well we, I mean, I mean, this is interesting. You only have so much service, right? Yeah, I mean, we we we, we heard Kroger's yesterday. I mean, they're using this as a, as a huge differentiator. But they're not outsourcing. Right, 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 right. I mean, for the things that you outsource, if what you're doing, anybody else could buy, it's not a differentiator. Yeah, but I think they were trying to say that, you, that CIOs could make your infrastructure a differentiator mm -hmm. in terms of efficiency, mm -hmm. in terms of search. I mean, it was a whole big pitch to get people to be CIOs, right? Yeah, I think if you look at it, you have to pick your business strategy and then the role IT has in that, right? So yeah. if you're if you're strategy is to be a low-cost provider, Walmart, you know, own the network. Own the data. Own the, own the network, force your ecosystem to go DDI. I mean, yeah. they did that, they created markets because they, they had to, so I say Walmart's more of an IT company than they are a, a grocery yeah. company, but their, their business strategy is low cost, of which IT is an enabler, so I think they go hand in hand. You know, I think you have to be careful if you say that, you know, hey, you know, um, you know we're gonna be a, a low-cost uh, provider, and you look at the type of service you're providing, it's not academics, it's pure technology, and then you go outsource it, then you're gonna become, I think, you know, subject to the also rates, um, because you're only as good as the, as the, as the lowest level. Are we done? About that time. Thank, Thank you time. for your time. Right. Thank you. Thank you.